Open your Bibles this morning, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 24. Uh, keep your Bibles close to you. We're going to be jumping around a lot this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning in verse 24. And when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the sin of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the cup, uh, eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Let us pray. Lord God, as we study your word today and as we share this memorial meal, help us to remember the reason why you gave it to us in the first place. I pray that we will examine ourselves this morning and not... Uh, take our sins lightly, nor your sacrifice lightly. As I go to share your word this morning, I pray that you will forgive uh, your speaker of his sins, though they are many. And I pray that you will not let them stand in the way of the proclamation of your word. Holy Spirit, we ask for your help this morning. We remember the Pharisees studied the scriptures and memorized large portions, but did not recognize Jesus when he came because their hearts were hardened, their eyes were blinded, and their ears were deafened. I pray this morning that you will soften our hearts and open our eyes and ears, help us to recognize the truth revealed in God's holy scripture. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we make these requests, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Why do we have communion? And why do we have it so often? There is nothing in the Bible that tells us how often we are to serve communion or the Lord's Supper. Many believe that in the first century they shared the Lord's Supper every time they met. And for that reason, some churches continue to do so today. Others serve it less frequently as we do primary reason we do not serve it more frequently is because I don't want it to become a uh, rope. I don't want it to become habit. I don't want it to become something that we do just out of um, tradition or regularity so that we overlook it and forget the significance and the importance of what we are doing. The church I attended as a child served communion once a quarter. Right now we usually serve it once a month. But why do we have communion in the first place, number one, we celebrate communion because Jesus told us to. Jesus said, this, uh, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This passage indicates that Jesus expected us, even commanded us, to share this meal on a regular basis. So we share this meal because Jesus told us to. Second, we share this meal because it is a reminder meal. We as humans, as people, have terrible memories. Go back and look at the history of Israel. They would follow the Lord for a while and He would bless them. Then they would forget what disobedience cost them and they would start living like the rest of the world. And God would judge them and punish them and then there would be repentance and they would return to the Lord again. And after a while, after they enjoyed His blessings for a while, they would rebel and turn against Him. It was a cycle again and again. We people have terrible memories. My word, look at our own country right now. How many people have forgotten that this nation was formed as a Christian nation? And the only reason we've made it this far is because God is a gracious God. And turn to someone near you and tell them, you sure are forgetful. 
We are a forgetful people. Shoot, Austin, I can't remember why I went into a room. I'd forget my head if it wasn't attached. This morning, Gladys walked into the kitchen to turn off the faucet. And instead of turning off the faucet, she grabbed the remote control and turned off the lights underneath the cabinet and went to leave the kitchen. And she said, oh, yeah, I went in there to turn off the faucet. We are forgetful people. Two neighbors were talking about what they had done the previous evening. And one of the men said, well, last night we went to a, a conference on your memory, how to improve your memory. He said, well, what was the name of the speaker? He said, um, what is that real pretty flower that we share a lot? You know, the one with the thorns on it? He said, you mean Rose? Yeah, that's it. Hey, Rose, what was the name of that speaker we listened to last night? We are forgetful people. So Jesus said, share this meal so that you will remember. And there are two primary things Jesus wants us to remember. We share this meal to remember that there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. We people often think that we have to do something in order to earn salvation. I'll attend church, or I'll pray, or I'll give money to the church, or I'll help people, or I'll do something in order to earn my salvation. So Jesus gave us the bread and he said, this bread is my body which is broken for you. My friends, when Jesus died on that cross, he paid the entire price for your sins. There is nothing you can do to add to what he has done. There is nothing you can do that will take away from what he has done. In Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 5, we read, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we all are healed. All we like sheep have grown astray. We have turned every man to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Oh, my friends. When Jesus hung on that cross, our Heavenly Father placed on Him all of our sins. And there's nothing in the world that you can do to add to the price that He has paid, nor nothing you can do that will take away from the sacrifice that He made. Back in the first century, when someone was crucified, they would place a sign over that person's head to state what the crime was that He was being crucified for. And over the head of Jesus, there was a sign which read, King of the Jews. Oh, but in writing, only our Heavenly Father could read were the words, the sins of Jean Gregory. And there written also was your name as well. My friend, Jesus died to pay the price. For your sins and mine. And there is nothing that you can do to add to the sacrifice that he has made. And nothing that you can do to take away from that sacrifice. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 we read, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by the grace of God. Not because of anything we have done or anything that we will do. But because we serve a loving. And a faithful. And a forgiving God. And on the cross. One of the last things Jesus said was. It is finished. As a Greek term. To tell us die. Which is an accounting term. Which means paid in full. We humans tend to forget that. Jesus gave us this memorial meal to remind us that there is nothing that we can do to add to what He has done. And nothing that we can do that will take away from what He has done. Oh, my salvation has been paid for. I cannot work my way to heaven. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We share this meal because Jesus told us to. 
We share this meal because it is a reminder meal. It reminds us that Jesus has paid it all. And there is nothing we can do to earn our salvation or to earn His forgiveness. And fourth, we share this meal because it reminds us that there is nothing we can do that Jesus cannot forgive us of. We suffer from two afflictions. First, we want to work our way to heaven or try to earn our salvation. And second, sometimes we tend to think that we have messed up so terribly, so bad, that there's no way God can ever forgive us. Oh, and the accuser, the devil, he will try to tell us that all the time. He will whisper in our ears and remind you of the sins that you have committed and tell you there is no way that God can forgive you. No way that that can be done away with. No way that He can ever use you again. Don't you see how you have messed up? How in the world could you hurt somebody like that? How in the world could you say something like that? There's no way God could ever forgive you. You're not really a Christian. God could never forgive you after all that you have done, after all of the people that you have hurt. Well, let me tell you this. According to the Jesus, the devil is a liar and has been from the beginning. In John 8, beginning in verse 42, Jesus confronting the Pharisees says, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil has been a liar ever since he spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden, ever since he first confronted man, and he continues to lie to this day. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we are told if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? This is the audience participation portion of our service. How much of our unrighteousness? All. All of it. Oh, my friends. I don't know what you've done. I don't know who you've hurt. I don't know what sin lies in your past. But God does. And the Bible says that He can forgive you of it. John, uh, man, if there was ever a person who messed up, it was King David. He had a faithful servant, a faithful soldier named Uriah, who went off and fought in his army. And while that faithful soldier was gone, David slept with his wife, got her pregnant, and then had Uriah killed to cover up his sin. A prophet came and confronted David about his sin. And David, overcome with grief, shame, and guilt, in the midst of that guilt, he wrote Psalm 51. Turn there with me, if you will, please. Psalm 51, and beginning of verse 1. There in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 51. Beginning in verse 1. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in your inner self and you teach me wisdom from within. David said, Lord, I have messed up, and day and night the sin keeps coming before my face. All I can do is remember the people I have hurt and the sin that I have committed and how I have disappointed you and let you down. David coming before the Lord says, Lord, I remember it all the time. But praise God, it doesn't stop there. Look with me, if you will, verse 7. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me. And I will be whiter than snow. Oh, my friends. David said, I have messed up God. Messed up worse than anybody else. But you can still clean me. You can still cleanse me. 
Oh, my friend, there is no sin so great that God cannot forgive you. You messed up. You did something stupid. You cannot believe you did it. You can't understand how or why you did it. Your friends and your family, they won't forget it. The devil keeps reminding you of it. And there it is. And like David said, my sin is always before me. But the Bible says that Jesus can make you white as snow. Again, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible tells us that God does three things with our sins when we confess them and ask Him to forgive us. First, He buries them. Micah chapter 7, beginning of verse 18, we read, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of His heritage? He does not retain His anger forever, because He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the ocean. Oh, my friends, when you confess your sins, the Bible says that God takes those sins and He buries them in the depths of the ocean. The story is told of an old man living in a retirement home, a devout Christian, a faithful believer, and he would read his Bible often during the day. And as he was reading through the pages of the Bible, he would start shouting, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! And he'd read a little bit more and he'd start shouting, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! After a while, the other people in the home got tired of listening to it. So one day they hid his Bible on him. Next thing they knew, he was sitting there in there reading a magazine. And he started shouting again, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They come in there and say, what in the world are you doing? We hid your Bible from you. What are you reading now? He said, I'm reading this magazine. And it talks about the Mariana Trench. And it says in here that that trench is more than seven miles deep. And that's where God put my sins. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, my friends, when you confess your sins, God takes some suckers and buries them in the depths of the ocean. Second. The Bible tells us that He removes them. Psalm 103, beginning at verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. My word, you start going north and after a while you begin going south. You start heading south and after a while you're going north again. But you head east and you can go east forever. You start heading west. You can go west forever. And God said, that is how far I have put your sins away from you and away from me so that I will remember them no more. God buries and hides our sins. He puts them as far as the east is from the west. And third, He does away with them. Isaiah chapter 38 verse 17. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Oh, my friends, God places our confessed sins behind His back so that He doesn't see them anymore. So that He doesn't remember them anymore. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Oh, people talk about there's nothing God can't do. Well, there's something God can't do. He can't remember our sins once we've confessed them and forgotten them. Because He says He will remember them no more. Isn't that great news? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. That makes me White as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, and if all of that is true, then what is that accusing voice you hear again and again reminding you of your past failures? That's nothing but the devil trying to guilt you into giving up. No wonder in Revelation chapter 12 he is called the accuser. Well, I love that song by Morgan Cryer called What Sin? It says, it happened so long ago, and I cried out for mercy back then. I pled the blood of Jesus, begged Him to forgive my sin, but I still can't forget it. It just won't go away. So I wept again, Lord, wash my sin. But this is all He'd say. What sin? What sin? Well, that's as far away as the east is from the west. 
What sin? What sin? It was gone the very minute you confessed. Buried in the sea of forgetfulness. Oh, what sin? So Jesus gave us a memorial meal so that we were reminded that we cannot work our way to heaven. The bread reminds us of His broken body by which He paid for all our sins. The juice reminds us of His shed blood that washes away our sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have done for us. Now briefly, before we share this memorial meal, let me address the question. If Jesus has forgiven us of our sins and we cannot earn our way to heaven, if Jesus has washed away our sins and there's nothing we can do to add to it or take away from it, then why serve the Lord? We continue to serve the Lord for several reasons. First, we serve the Lord because He is our boss. Turn with me please to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 45. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 45. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why serve the Lord? We serve the Lord because He is our boss. When Jesus comes back, I want Him to find me faithfully serving. I want Him to find me sharing as He commanded us to do. We work, we serve because God the Father is our boss. Second, we serve because Jesus tells us to. In Matthew chapter 28 verse 19, he says, Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus gave us a job to do. He told us to go and make disciples, to tell other people what Jesus has done for us and what He can do for them, the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, my friends, how can we not share that good news? How can we not tell a lost and dying world about a heavenly Father that loved them so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to pay a price so that they might be saved? That's too good a news not to share. We serve because the Lord is our boss. We sh serve because He has told us to. And third, we serve because service is an indication of salvation. Turn with me please to James chapter 2 and verse 14. James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works, can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one. Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works and offering Isaac his son on the altar? 
You see that faith was active together with his works. And by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. If you are truly saved, you're going to want to serve the Lord out of gratitude of nothing else because it pleases Him. When you get married, unless you're a self-centered narcissist, you're going to want to do things to make the other person happy because you claim to love them because that is your spouse. I've been trying to get our house pressure washed now for a month. So far, I've got about 12 foot of the back wall done and the back porch. That's it. Why am I anxious to get it done? Because it will make Gladys happy. James says, if you're not serving the Lord, it's an indication that you really might not be saved. Because with salvation comes a changed heart that makes you desire to serve and to please the Lord. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus asked the question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? In Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Oh, can you imagine the privilege of giving Jesus something to drink? Can you imagine the privilege and the honor of buying Jesus a meal? And Jesus said, when you serve one of these, you're serving me. Let me ask you, my friend, what does your service say about your heart? Does your service indicate that you're really in love with Jesus and striving to please Him and make Him happy? We serve the Lord not to get saved. We serve the Lord because we are saved. He is our boss. We serve Him because He tells us to. We serve Him in order to be, we serve Him in order to please Him. And we serve Him because there are rewards that come with that. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. Look there with me if you will, please. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Can you imagine? Not only does the Lord save us and paid a terrible price to purchase our salvation. But He also rewards us when we are faithful. You see, this life is only preparation for what's coming next. And I don't know about you, my friend, but I want to hear Jesus say, Well done, good and faithful 
fervent. You see, this short life we live here on earth is only preparation for the much, much longer life we will live after we leave here. I remember when I was in college. Man, I wanted to get that over with. I hated school. I took as many classes as they'd let me because I wanted to get it over with as fast as possible. So I was able to finish my bachelor's in three years. My mom said, slow down. What's your hurry? I said, I want to get on with life. She said, college is part of your life. I'm like, no, it's not. This is something I got to do in order to start living. I want to get this over with. Well, let me tell you, my friends, this life is just preparation for what's coming next. And the closer I get to the, my final exam, the more I'm looking forward to the life that is coming next. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This bread is to remind you that you cannot add to anything that I have already done. And this juice is to remind you that when I called you and saved you, I already factored in your disobedience, your rebellion, and your sin. And there is nothing you can do so bad that will keep me from loving you and keep me from forgiving you. Let us pray. Father, now we Christians are mighty forgetful folks. And we find ourselves sometimes trying to work so that we can get good enough that we get to go to heaven. Lord, through this meal, remind us that Jesus paid it all. And there's nothing we can add to what he has done. And Lord, sometimes we mess up so bad. And the accuser comes and whispers in our ear, see there, you're not really saved. See there, you're still thinking this way, you're still talking this way, you're still treating people this way. There's no way God can forgive you. Lord, help us to remember at those times, this juice representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ that is capable of washing away all our sins. In the name that is above every name. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.